Controversies and Novel Therapies for Acne Hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in. In this episode, Dr. James Del Rosso will discuss some clinical pearls about common controversies as well as recent developments in acne therapy. Dr. Del Rosso, what is your approach to minimizing antibiotic resistance in acne? When we um, encounter a patient with acne vulgaris that we're determining has the severity where we're going to continue systemic treatment, and often that would be an oral antibiotic uh, for acne where they uh, tried topical uh, therapy and it's a, a, a good try, a, a long enough try of, with compliance with a good topical regimen, a full court press, what I like to call a full court press topical regimen, then we're thinking about systemic treatment. Obviously, we consider oral isotretinoin in appropriate cases, uh, but patients may not necessarily uh, want to go on that treatment or not yet be uh, be believed to be candidates, that's based on the patient and the clinician deciding on that. But certainly oral antibiotic therapy, if patients have a disease that's at least moderate uh, to severe uh, based on what you're looking at and resistant to topical therapy alone or not uh, adequately responsive to topical therapy alone, uh, then we will often use oral antibiotic treatment. And the, the way that I think to minimize resistance, because oral antibiotics and topical antibiotics for, the, uh, for that matter can certainly predispose to antibiotic resistant strains, not only with uh, C acnes, uh, which we used to call P acnes, Propioni bacterium acnes, now cutie bacterium acnes, which is the organism we're trying to suppress as part of our, uh, as a part of our acne treatment, one of the things we're trying to do with antibiotics. Uh, we're not only concerned about resistance to that organism, we're concerned about resistance that can develop in other uh, in other bacteria that are just exposed because they're there. They're bystanders, but they're still exposed to the antibiotic, and we can get the ecologic mischief of resistant strains that may be clinically relevant in that patient or someone that they're passed through down the line. So we want to minimize the antibiotic resistance. We do that by discussing up front with the patient that, we're going to use this oral antibiotic treatment, but it's not something that we want to necessarily use indefinitely for a prolonged period of time. We hope, hopefully, we'll get you off of this within three to four months. We have to see how you respond. Uh, you have to be compliant with your topical treatment in addition to your oral antibiotic treatment. So we discuss an exit plan. We don't always know how it's going to work out or how long that treatment is going to, to need to go for. Uh, in that mm -hmm. patient, uh, but it's something that we let them know this is not something we want you to be on indefinitely because we want to minimize uh, resistant bacterial strains. On the skin, we like to use a benzoyl peroxide to try to reduce the emergence of, of resistant bacteria, including C. acnes. Uh, that obviously doesn't affect internally uh, the GI tract, the vaginal tract in women, the oropharynx, the nasopharynx, other parts of the body where the, a, a, an oral antibiotic is exposed to, but certainly can be a factor on the skin. So the discussion of the exit plan is one of the ways that we try to minimize antibiotic resistance. We try to limit the duration. But then again, it's going to have a lot to do with how the patient responds. And I let them know that we really might need to get into a more um, detailed discussion with oral isotretinoin uh, to really get your acne under control if this is not going to be adequately, uh, adequate enough or we're constantly cycling you on antibiotics, oral antibiotics, over several right. months, even years in some cases in the literature. So we let them know up front that that's a serious discussion we may need to get into depending on the response of the patient. Are the newer antibiotics better in terms of resistance? Well, all the antibiotics, uh, anytime you give a patient an antibiotic, and here we're focusing on oral antibiotics, you're going to select out a re resistant strains of bacteria. There's, there's no way to get around that. That's called antibiotic selection pressure. Uh, the newer, the newest oral antibiotic we have, which has been described in the literature as a narrow spectrum tetracycline, which is oral saracycline, has a, 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 
more narrow spectrum of antibiotic activity as compared to tetracyclines that we commonly use like doxycycline and minocycline, which are broad spectrum, which are obviously agents we've depended on for decades for the treatment of acne and still do because they remain effective. Uh, but with the oral serocycline, there's uh, much less activity against a variety of different gram-negative organisms. Many are, are in the GI tract microbiome. Uh, so if we can circumvent selecting out these resistant gram-negative bacteria, dermatologists may think, well, well, you know, we don't we don't encounter that very much. We're not talking about us encountering it. We're talking about selecting out resistant gram-negatives that can then be exposed to other people or even in that patient that may cause an infection that one of our colleagues in another area of medicine may have to encounter, uh, not necessarily for a dermatologic condition. So regardless, we want to limit the, the bacterial resistance as much as we possibly can, not only against the pathogens that we treat in dermatology, but against bacteria that can be then exposed to anyone that can get another type of infection uh, that is being treated by another type of clinician. They're not coming to the dermatologist for that. So we know that oral serocycline has a, a, a more narrow spectrum, and that could potentially correlate with a, a lower emergence of clinically relevant resistant organisms. We don't have all that data, but we do have the microbiologic data to show that it's more narrow spectrum. Okay. The, basically what we have with the orals, right? That's the only new agent that's come to uh, to the market, specifically approved only for acne, right? Not for treatment of cutaneous infections. Why are dermatologists hesitant in using oral isotretinoin? Some of the reasons are, you know, the eye pledge program, some feel is a hassle and they don't want to deal with, but for the most part, We've gotten around a lot of that as people have become familiar with it um, and been able to integrate the eye pledge program into their practice. Some might be hesitant because of the potential of, of overpopularized uh, adverse events, like is there association with inflammatory bowel disease or depression and suicidal tendencies and things that were popularized in the literature that are actually fairly rare. Uh, if they do occur and more likely idiosyncratic. There, it depends on the dermatologist if they feel I don't want to hassle with that possibility even in one patient. Some of them may be gun shy in that, in that regard uh, to use oral isotretinoin. But I think the majority of dermatologists recognize that oral isotretinoin is the one treatment that is by far the best treatment for patients that have uh, inflammatory and comedonal acne that's severe. Doesn't necessarily have to be nodular. Certainly if there's nodular acne, it's the most effective treatment and it's the only therapy that provides the patient the likelihood of prolonged remission after you stop the course of treatment with the drug. So it has definitive uh, advantages of efficacy and prolonged benefit that other uh, other therapies do not have. But it's probably side effects and medical legal concerns and maybe the eye pledge program are the reasons why some dermatologists are hesitant. But the majority of dermatologists utilize oral isotretinoin because they want to get their patients the best result when that time point comes that the patient really needs it. Acne is a very frustrating disease. Having lived with it uh, through high school during the day when we didn't have any anywhere near the quality of options that we have now and certainly didn't have oral isotretinoin. Um, one of the wishes I would have had is I wish I had oral isotretinoin in high school being called pizza face because my acne was so severe. Thank God I have such a great personality that I that my personality could win people over because my face certainly didn't. I had very, very severe acne. Uh, but the bottom line is we have these options now and we have to make sure patients are properly educated. We cannot guarantee that anything is going to be completely safe, but we can guarantee we're going to work with them as closely as possible to get them the best treatment. And if side effects uh, occur, we're going to work closely with them to get through those situations. 
What are some of the advantages with the newer topical retinoids? Well, I, I think that with topical retinoids, the bottom line is if you can get patients to use a well-formulated topical retinoid on a regular basis, they work, okay? So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that one is is the thoroughbred and all the others are way behind in the race. If you, you can get patients on a, a well-formulated a topical retinoid that's not irritating and delivers, whether it's tretinoin, adapalene, or tazaratine, those patients are going to – it's rare that patients are not going to get significant benefit. Some of the advantages of the newer agents uh, that we have, well, there's one specifically that's an actual new topical retinoid that is uh, described as a retinoic acid receptor gamma uh, more selective and more specific to that particular receptor. We don't know the clinical relevance of that. Um, we know that all of the topical retinoids can influence a retinoic acid receptor gamma, which is the predominant receptor in the skin. Uh, but this uh, it has a greater selectivity. It's trifaratine. Uh, but really, the differentiation with trifaratine beyond that, because we know that's a scientific differentiation but it's not necessarily something that we can say is clinically relevant, that it would add additional efficacy. We don't know that, right? But we do know that it has that selectivity. Where it really had differentiated itself, it's the first topical retinoid that was formally studied for truncal acne, right? So we, we certainly have data where patients would utilize different treatments, whether it be an oral agent or a topical agent or a topical retinoid, they could use it on the trunk. We didn't formally capture in the pivotal trials that were submitted to the FDA the way we would always capture data on the face with lesion counts and investigative global assessments that were analyzed statistically stringently by the FDA to get a specific approval based on formal study. This is the first topical retinoid that that's been done with. So even though the other the other topical agents are approved for acne and can be used on the trunk, the level of data that was collected has only been done with trifaratine to date. They specifically did that in their uh, development through their phase three trial. So they have specific data on both the face and the trunk that's held to the standard of phase three studies by the FDA. So that, that can be certainly thought of as an advantage because you can look at that data and determine uh, the efficacy is there for both the face and the trunk. Trunkal acne is very common. It's often forgotten about. At least half the patients that come in that are showing you acne on the face have acne on the trunk. They don't necessarily talk about it. And if you don't look, you don't find it, right? But it doesn't mean it's not important to them. It's obvious that you can see what's on the face, and a lot of times that's where the discussion goes, or maybe the patient's embarrassed to disrobe or show you their trunk uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but if you ask them, they'll, let, they'll tell you that it's important that you also – over 70% of them, if you tell them, would you also like treatment on the trunk, they want their truncal acne treated. So truncal acne is, is, is very important, just like facial acne. The other uh, – uh, agents uh, that are topical retinoids are different formulations. We have with trifa with uh, with tazaratine, we have foam formulation, uh, which has been shown to be very effective in the patient experience program, as well as uh, the, the FDA approved trials where it was evaluated under its own new drug application. Uh, that's Fabier foam. Trifaratine uh, is Acleaf, is marketed as Acleaf. Uh, uh, the Fabior foam, the 0.1% foam, is uh, is tazaratine, okay? And there's data on that. There's also a newly approved lotion formulation of tazaratine, which is a lower concentration, a 0.045%. It's a lower concentration of, of, of uh, tazaratine lotion called Araslo, which has very good data, uh, and actually had compar comparative data to the 0.1% cream where it had equivalent efficacy but better tolerability. And that's a very, very nice, well-formulated vehicle uh, that the tolerability and the delivery of the drug with a lower concentration 
still maintains the efficacy. So we have better choices of vehicles, and we also have the trifaritine, which is formally studied also for truncal acne. Should we pay more attention to truncal acne? Well, obviously, uh, if patients have truncal acne, it, I think it's important for us to know that it's there and a, important, uh, important for us to address it if it's important to the patient, and very often it's going to be. Um, it, it's harder to treat because it's a much wider body surface area, so topical therapy, even though we have studies on topical drugs, you have to make sure the patient gets the widespread application because you have the chest, the upper arms, uh, the back to deal with. Uh, so we should be paying more attention to it because it is important to the patients. It's just been ignored compared to facial acne over the years, especially in clinical studies. So, yes, if it's important to the patient, it's important to us, but a lot of times we have to inquire because patients don't necessarily bring everything up. Thank <laughs> you.